July 26, 1863. The Battle of Salineville, Ohio. Shackelford's Union forces versus Morgan's remaining Confederate cavalry. After an hour and a half of fighting, Shackelford's forces have pushed Morgan's remaining men north in a retreat. Following the final engagement between these two forces, ultimately leading to Morgan's surrender in West Point, Ohio. Thanks for joining us in this very special episode of Revamping History. We're your hosts, Roy and Jesse Hensroff, and we're currently standing at the spot of Morgan's surrender that has been commemorated by this rock statue right here in West Point, Ohio. But to understand how this raid ended, let's go back and see how the Morgan raids began. The Morgan raids started on July 2nd, 1863, when General John Hunt Morgan entered Kentucky with approximately 2,500 men and four pieces of artillery. By July 7th, Morgan and his men had reached the southern bank of the Ohio River. There they captured two steamboats and ferried their men across the river into southern Indiana. After Morgan's force had fully crossed, they burnt and sunk the Alistine. This river crossing was against the orders of his superior, General Braxton Bragg, who was the commander of the Army of the Tennessee. By July 13th, Morgan had reached the Ohio border. crossed into Ohio at a place called Harrison, which is uh, north and west of Cincinnati. And then even though um, Morgan was kind of brash with some of his activities, he knew better than to try to capture Cincinnati. So they, they passed around Cincinnati. Um, they covered 90 miles in 36 hours without anybody getting any sleep or rest and very little in the way of, of food. Morgan then crossed the Scioto River at Piketon, Ohio. At this point, Morgan was desperate to get out of Ohio and rejoin the Confederacy. But Morgan and his men were constantly being chased by Shackelford and his forces, much like a modern day police chase with no real direction. So he had people behind him at all times and, uh, and the Union forces were taking advantage of their uh, ability to summon more troops and uh, uh, to block roads and railroad lines and, and that sort of thing. By July 19, 1863, Morgan and his men had made it to Buffington Island where they ran into Union forces. By that time he had, uh, according to some of the sources, about 2,000 men left. And they, they ended up in a, a fight at Buffington Island that did not go well for them. And as a result, uh, Colonel Duke, Basil Duke, the brother-in-law, was captured with most of his command. So Morgan escaped, and, and I, you're gonna hear that repeatedly, Morgan always seemed to escape. Morgan then headed north upriver on the Ohio side. In Reedsville, Ohio, Morgan forded the river into West Virginia, West Virginia had just been admitted to the Union as a new state on June 20th, 1863. This new state was previously part of the state of Virginia. Morgan was actually across the river with part of his command when gunboats appeared, Union gunboats. So they were going to make it difficult for the remaining troops to get across and uh, the Union Cavalry was, was coming up behind uh, the ones that were still on the Ohio side. So Morgan returned, you know, swam his horse back across the river or dashed across the river and uh, rejoined the men on the Ohio side. And there's, there's some estimate that maybe three or four hundred men got away there but they were lost to, the, to Morgan's command. And he would have liked to have gotten the entire command across, but he didn't. So then he, he continues up the river, and every time they try to approach the river to cross, to get back to what they hoped would be friendlier territory, the gunboats were there, or the cavalry was there. Um, uh, when they got to Jefferson County, uh, it was very clear to them that the, the telegraph had been working against them. 
Traveling with General Morgan was Captain George A. Ellsworth, who was a telegrapher. Ellsworth was brought by Morgan to intercept messages and to send out wrong and confusing telegraphs in an attempt to disrupt Union intelligence. They had a, a fellow with them throughout their raiding career uh, named Ellsworth, and Ellsworth had been a telegrapher in his former life, and, and he still was, and they, they were famous for connecting to the Union telegraph lines and um, sending false messages. Fake news, I guess, is, is another term for it. But they would they would say, uh, you know, Morgan is, is has captured, you know, whatever stronghold. He's got, you know, 10,000 men with him. He's headed for wherever, just anything to throw off the, the Union forces. By July 25th, Morgan and his men came to a town called Nebo, now known as Burkholz. There, the Morgan Raiders stayed the night. While they were enjoying their, their a little bit of sleep in, in uh, what is now Burkholz, the telegraph wires were busy uh, summoning more men. So we know that, that uh, Burnside in Cincinnati organized anybody that he could find to, to get on the trains and head up uh, across Ohio and up the river to create an unpleasant surprise for, for Morgan and his remaining men. And of course, the, the cavalry that had been pursuing them for a couple weeks were still within, within shouting distance of them. The morning of July 26th, 1863, Morgan and his raiders were awakened by Union skirmishers. Many more troops were arriving to Selenville by rail. The flight was on again. The initial goal was to get to Selenville, which was known to be a railroad uh, station. One of the scouts that he had sent out to Selenville said, this is not going to work. There, there are more troops in Selenville than we've seen you know, since we left Kentucky. As the Morgan Raiders tried to get around Selenville, they once again came under attack by Union forces. There were many skirmishes as this quickly became a moving battle, now known as the Battle of Selenville. Outnumbered and outgunned, Morgan and his remaining forces then fled the outskirts of Selenville, effectively ending the battle, which has been commemorated by this rock statue behind me. Morgan and his men then headed towards West Point. The result of the Battle of Selenville for Morgan was approximately two killed, 50 wounded, and 200 captured. Morgan and a few remaining men briefly escaped capture and headed towards West Point, Ohio, just outside of modern-day Lisbon, Ohio. They knew Morgan was coming, and in the, the fair village of Lisbon, which happened to be, the, and still is, the county seat of Columbiana County, they, they were ringing the bells and the women were crying and people were hiding in their basements because they were convinced that Morgan was coming to get them. Out of concern from the approaching raiders, some of the money and valuables of the village of New Lisbon were gathered and moved to a safe location. New Lisbon was also well known at that time for supporting the abolitionist movement. Lisbon was a very important outpost on the Underground Railroad. There's a very strong abolitionist movement here, as in Salem. People were against slavery, and they often did a lot to help runaway slaves. New Lisbon called out the Home Guard. This was a call to arms to the old and young, as most able-bodied men were already in the Union Army. We went through the war with very few young men left in town. Uh, we had a Home Guard of older men, many who had been some of the original settlers in Lisbon, and they went about drilling and organizing themselves so that they would be prepared to defend their home should it be needed. These are not soldiers for the most part. These are just adult or semi-adult uh, male citizens, and they called them out to got to go out and defend the village, some on foot, some on horseback. and. Uh, they left Lisbon after a, a quick meal at, uh, on the square and uh, that the women put together for them. The ladies of the town uh, knew that they needed to get some food prepared because these people were going to need support, the soldiers and whatever. So they got their saw horses off the farm and laid doors across them so that they could have a place to prepare food. 
And the farm wives brought in things like uh, hard-boiled eggs, ham sandwiches, because of course they all had hams in the smokehouse, and they had fresh buns, fresh bread that they had baked, and made very simple food. Uh, I'm sure that they brought out some of the cider and the beer and whatever else they might have been making, and that was on the square available uh, for anyone who needed food to stop and get the food. So people, they were scared. They thought that Morgan was going to, like I say, burn down the village. So this was, they want, they were protecting their, their homes. So I'm not surprised a bit. Also, as I said before, Lisbon was a strong abolitionist movement here. And people here felt very strongly that slavery should be abolished. So the Confederates were not well liked. They thought this is a matter of principle. You know, this is, they were against slavery. Morgan represented slavery. So of course they rushed out to meet Morgan to make sure he you know, wasn't successful. And they headed out. I don't know how anxious they were to come to grips with uh, you know, Morgan and his cutthroats, but, uh, and that's how they were frequently referred to. But they headed uh, south of Lisbon uh, towards Basically, uh, they were headed towards Route 518. The new Lisbon Home Guard then proceeded to march approximately four miles south of Lisbon on modern day Route 164. The Home Guard, the old gentlemen with their squirrel guns, all got here, got together in Lisbon, and they went south on what we call now Route 164. It's the road to Salineville at that time. And they set up bales of hay and obstacles that they thought would help stop Morgan before he could get clear into town. And they set up um, some sort of a barricade and, and uh, were waiting for Morgan to show up. So Morgan's headed east. He's got men pursuing him, maybe not in immediate contact, but not far behind. He's got independent Union cavalry that, that were just a minute too slow to get to him. As Morgan and his men approached the Home Guard barricade, the new Lisbon Home Guard became impatient and sent the men on horseback further south. They basically marched themselves right out of any role in this. They, they couldn't wait, or at least that's the story, that uh, they couldn't wait to see what happened. So they, they, were, they were gone and they were not part of it. So it was all uh, men on foot that were left behind. The Home Guard then decided to send three men out to scout the area. And one of them was James Burbick, and uh, there was another one who, who thank God, wrote a, a long account of what he saw that day, and it, it kind of um, uh, alters some of what Burbick claimed in later years. And it's, it, as I read it, I find it very believable. But uh, anyway, these, these three men rode out to see if they could scout Morgan's command before it got there, and they ended up running right into him. Two of these men were captured by Morgan, while the third man was able to escape and warn the rest of the home guard and the village. And the tale he told when he got there is, Morgan's coming, run for your lives. After hearing this message, most of the home guard quickly dispersed. Morgan spoke to James Burbick, who was doing the negotiation on behalf of the new Lisbon home guard. Morgan had turned to him and said, would you accept the surrender of my sick and wounded men? He said, well, I, I, I suppose. I mean, I can imagine you, you're, you're captured. You are a prisoner, and you, the guy that is holding your fate in his hands wants to know if you'll accept his, the surrender of part of his command. And he said, oh, yeah, I guess. Burbick had no choice but to agree to Morgan's terms. Burbick had said, well, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. By this point, official Union forces were closing in on all sides. A small Union force had also gathered at a local farm in hopes of intercepting Morgan and his men. And it was a uh, farmer named Krubaugh who, who owned the farm. And uh, they, they went up and they formed a line across Route 518. Around this time, General Morgan spoke to Burbick about fully surrendering himself and his raiders to the new Lisbon Home Guard. And, and poor Burbick said, well, I, I guess, sure, why not? Um, and again, he's not a military person. Some of the people afterwards referred to him as a, as a copperhead and the town drunk. As Morgan thinks about trying to flee, he determined that all routes of escape were blocked by Union forces that were ready to engage him and his men. And they're ready to fight. They were, they were armed with pistols and carbines and, and sabers and the whole, the whole nine yards. 
So there was a, Morgan sent one of his officers out to negotiate, and uh, one of the prisoners, um, not, not Burbick, but, but one, the other one who had been captured uh, just you know, minutes before, went with them. So I, I just get a, a, a sense of a very informal kind of uh, uh, custody on these, these so-called prisoners. But they went forward and, and talked to the, um, tried to bluff their way past this Union detachment, and, and that wasn't going to work. Um, the guy said, tell him that, that uh, we're not surrendering, we're not going to let him pass, and he, he, can, he can fight us or surrender. There was no further fighting. Um, the Confederates uh, basically got off their horses and almost immediately most of them fell asleep. Morgan surrendered. He was not captured in the sense that we usually mean. Instead, he surrendered, knowing that he would get better terms of surrender from this elderly gentleman than he would the regular U.S. Army under Shackelford. Morgan was required, of course, to turn over his arms. His men were required to turn in their guns and things, and they were stacked, and they had a regular surrender ceremony. And to this day, there's a big argument because just about the time that everything was completed, General Shackelford got here. And being regular U.S. Army, it was going to help his career in the military if he was the one to capture John Hunt Morgan. After Confederate General John Hunt Morgan had already surrendered to Captain James Burbick of the New Lisbon Home Guard, Major George Washington Rue of the Union Army arrived on the scene. Major George W. Rue quickly attempted to take control over the surrender of Morgan and his raiders, but Rue quickly backed off when Union General James Shackelford arrived on the scene. Shackelford ultimately will take credit for the surrender and all previous surrender terms between Morgan and Burbick were quickly dismissed. Part of Burbick's terms included instantly paroling Morgan's men. Major Rue also conceded his claim and terms for the Morgan surrender. And, and he's not going to challenge General Shackelford. So at one point in all these silly proceedings, Morgan demanded to be put back on the field and they would fight it out rather than, than just surrender to the Shackelford. I think he was probably worried about the treatment that he might get. Uh, that didn't happen, but even, even afterwards, for, for a couple weeks afterwards, in captivity, Morgan was writing to the Ohio governor demanding that, that they recognize this earlier surrender to Burbank. They, they were basically saying that this guy had no, no authority to accept a surrender from somebody who was holding a gun on him to begin with. And at any rate, the, the Confederates were all, all gathered up and, and awoken uh, from their naps. Um, one of the more reliable stories says that they captured 336 men and 400 horses at, at that site, at the surrender site. But there was no, no real fight at the surrender site except hurt feelings and accusations. But they got, they got the guys, uh, the 336 men, they marched them back to um, Salineville. Uh, they put them on a train and brought them to Wellsville. And the officers were housed overnight in the Whitaker House Hotel. The story, and it's, it's well dealt with in uh, Last Night and Last Day, is that Morgan was, was so grateful at how he had been treated at the Whitaker house that he presented his sword to the owner, uh, Mr. Whitaker. The Last Night and Day of John Morgan's Raid was originally published in East Liverpool, Ohio in 1913. This publication was written by Jeremiah and Virginia Sims and contains dozens of first-hand accounts of Ohio citizens who came face-to-face -face with Morgan and his raiders. A lot of the information in this video came directly from this publication. All right, these are a few of our pieces that we have in our collection. This is the original 1913 first edition of Last Night and Last Day of John Morgan's Raids. This was one of the original ones that came out. We keep it in the plastic. We don't really read this one as not to cause damage to it. 
but this one, smaller one, this one came out in 1963. This one's a little bit easier to read. It's written out more like a book. So, and it's not as fragile, but it is still, I mean, it's got some age on it. It's a lot of history in it, a lot of first-hand accounts. Really good stuff. It's a masterpiece of American literature, if you can get your hands on it. All right, and then finally, this is a newspaper. This one was out, released by Army and Navy Journal. This would have come out on April 9th, 1864. So, this would have been still during the Civil War. But it goes on to talk about Morgan's surrender and some of the other events that were going on around that time. So yeah, these are a few of the pieces that we have. And we hope you guys can find the story. It's a really great story, and if you can read it, please do so. Some of Morgan's men were sent to Western State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, while Morgan himself and his higher-up officers were sent to the Ohio Penitentiary in Columbus, Ohio. On November 27, 1863, Morgan and a few of his officers were able to escape the Ohio Penitentiary through a tunnel they had dug. From there, they scaled the prison wall and headed towards the closest railroad station. They took a train towards Cincinnati. Morgan and his men jumped off the train early at Ludlow Ferry on the Ohio River. This was to avoid being detected in Cincinnati. There they ferried across the Ohio River into Kentucky. He probably should have stayed in prison because after he got back, he was criticized a lot for what he had done against orders. Um, and the, the quality of the men that he was able to recruit after he returned was not anywhere near, you know, what he had lost on the raid. On the morning of September 4th, 1864, in Greenville, Tennessee, Union forces had surrounded Morgan's position. After vowing to never be taken prisoner again, Morgan attempted to flee. When Morgan refused to surrender, he was shot and killed by former Confederate soldier Andrew Campbell, who was now a soldier in the Union Army. The shooting took place in the garden of the Williams family estate. This officially marked the end of General John Hunt Morgan. He was 39 years old. In the early 1900s, a local wealthy musician named Will Thompson paid to have the Surrender Monument made and dedicated. Unfortunately, Will Thompson passed away before the Surrender Monument was officially placed. In the years following the Surrender Monument dedication, the large rock was moved multiple times and disputes over land ownership gave the Surrender Monument an unsure future. Luckily, in 2004, East Liverpool lawyer and historian Tim Brooks took action. So then it turns out that this land that had been leased would revert to the descendants of the original owners of the farm, but they didn't want the monument on it. Um, I had done some checking and uh, we still owned a 20 foot by 30 foot piece of land that had been deeded to the historical society by the Krubaugh family. And some of the wrought iron fence was still there, so we could locate it. And my dad and I went out with our shovels and just, just did a little testing. And we found a, a uh, concrete pad about six inches down, which would have been where the, the monument sat. So we had all these meetings. I finally talked to the, the somebody at ODOT and I said, you know what, I, this is ridiculous. I said, you know, every, every two-bit nitwit in the county has an opinion. I said, we own the monument. Our guy paid for it. We own the land where it stood. I said, I'm tempted to just get a truck, a big truck, and, and move the, the thing back to its original site. And, and he looked around to see if anybody was watching and says, that would be your best bet. So that's what we ended up doing. We found a guy that, that had a huge wrecker, and I have pictures somewhere of, of that monument swinging back and forth behind that wrecker as we, we trucked it about a, a, not quite half a mile uh, back to its original site. So that's where it is now, and hopefully that's where it'll stay. Now the monument is back at the original location of Morgan's surrender. Around 2010, a local man brought a suspected Confederate revolver to the Lisbon Historical Society. This revolver is even thought to have been carried by one of Morgan's men. But about 10, 15 years ago, a gentleman came into the museum here and offered us a gun. 
a revolver that he said his grandfather, who lived on a farm along the route where Morgan traveled, his grandfather was digging for coal in the 1930s. It was a bad winter and there were coal seams on his farm. So he was digging coal at about 10 to 12 inches underground. His grandfather found this pistol. Um, granddad took the gun home, disassembled it, put it in a can of oil. And uh, Mr. Reynolds had, as he, he inherited the can of oil and the gun, he put the gun together and brought it in to us and wanted to know if we wanted it. And our first question was, can, what can you tell us about it? And the second one was, what are you expecting to be paid for it? He said, oh, I'm not expecting to be paid anything, anything for it. He said, I would just like it to be in a museum where other people could see it and donate it in memory of my grandfather. So we took it and then our next task became to try to verify that this was indeed a gun that might have been left by one of John Hunt Morgan's soldiers. The Lisbon Historical Society then had the revolver authenticated by two experts to see if there could be a Morgan connection. It's a five-shot Navy pistol. The pieces were made in various countries in Europe, and their speculation was probably shipped to the South uh, in pieces, and then the gun was assembled in the South. So anyway, they looked at it, and both of them agreed that yes, they could verify that it is definitely Southern and Confederate. It matches other things that they have seen that were definitely known to be that. They surmise and agree that because of where it was found, it was probably either tossed away by one of the Confederate soldiers that were with John Hunt Morgan because they knew they were going to be captured and thought that it would be better for them not to be armed or maybe it was dropped or whatever. The one expert told us, he says, in my mind, he said, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that that's how that, that's where this gun came from. And that was good enough for us. We do display it occasionally and with the caveat that as far as we have been able to authenticate and what common sense tells us, it was a John Hunt Morgan weapon. So that was just a brief summary of the Morgan raid and surrender. And also this video isn't meant to glamorize any violence that occurred during the Civil War, but rather spotlight an American Civil War event that took place right here in Columbiana County, Ohio. And remember, no matter where you live, your town has a story to tell. So make sure to visit your local historical society, library, or search the internet. You never know what you might learn. And thanks again to Tim Brooks, Mayor Wilson, Gene Crockey, and everyone at the Lisbon Historical Society. But most importantly, thank you for watching. See you next time.